Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Apostolic Faith Sunday School on Zoom. Amen. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to ask Brother Lee Spakowski if you would like to lead us in prayer. He's not here yet, uh, Brother Randy. You can call on another person, sir. Brother Alan Smith, you're with us. Would you like to do uh, the honors, please, and lead us in prayer? Brother Alan Smith, are you with us? Yes, he is. I think Brother Hal is trying to unmute. Brother Alan Smith is trying to unmute. Okay. Brother Mark Worthington, would you please pray for us? <laughs> Our dear Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving today for all that you've done. We pray that you'll be with us today in this Sunday school, Lord, and teach us to be more like you. Help us to understand your word that will not be deceived by the wickedness around us. We pray that you be with each and every one, even around the world, as they may be listening to this, that they may gain spiritually. We may draw closer together in fellowship. Understanding we believe the same thing and we're heading the same place, and that's heaven. Be with us now. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark. At this time, let us recite our memory verses. First of all, I would like to ask Victoria Ojime from our primary department. Would you please recite your memory verse for us? Yeah. <laughs> Thus said the Lord, God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 7. Very good. Thank you. And for the answer class, we would like to ask Carter Wells, would you please recite your memory verse for us? Um, great peace have they which love thy law. Psalm 119, 165. Very good. Thank you, Carter. <clears throat> and for our search class, we'll ask Sister Blessing, would you please recite our memory verse? This day the Lord thy God has commanded thee to do the statutes and judgments. Thou shalt surely keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 16. Amen. Thank you, Sister Blessing. Now, Brother O, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank, thank you so very much, uh, Brother Randy. And um, welcome, everyone, to our combined Zoom Sunday School class this morning. Special welcome to those who are here from our headquarters church in Portland, Oregon, and from different branch churches around the world. May God bless you all for being here this morning. If you have any prayer requests, please kindly enter those requests using the chat window. We will be sure to harvest those requests and distribute them to our headquarters church uh, for prayers too. Considering that we all want to enjoy the lesson, please kindly mute yourself when you are not talking. Um, that would really be helpful for everyone. There are security measures in place, as we know. I wouldn't need to go over that again. Um, 
but um, we know that God has protected this space for all of us and he will continue to do so for us. Thank you once again for joining us this morning. We have another beautiful lesson this morning titled God's First Written Law. Our teacher this morning is Reverend Mark Worthington, who is um, one of our retired pastors and a very active minister in our church in Sacramento, California, uh, where he continues to uh, lead missionary trips. Um, Brother Mark, we welcome you and Sister Rosemary this morning. Over to you, sir. God bless you. It's good to be here. And uh, we would love to be here every Sunday morning live. We have to listen to it later in the week because we have our own church activities going on. But, uh, and I'm about 40 minutes away from church. So we have a little bit of time problem there. But uh, we're here and we expect God to be with us in a special way. Our purpose this morning is to learn that God's first written law was given to Moses for the children of Israel. This directed God's chosen people how to live in harmony with him and with one another. Also, that people today must still follow God's instructions if they desire peace with God and their fellow man. These words, the law, the Hebrew people call it uh, 10 words in, in the old law, it meant the 10 commandments, have been around as a guiding light for close to 3,500 years. They transcend religion, region, culture, generation. Simply put, they work for every day. Given to us by the one who designed us, our creator. They are tailor-made for quality living in this world. Now in Exodus 20, uh, verses two and three, it says, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Now these people had been in bondage for some 400 years and around idolaters, sinful people, and many of them had gone back into sin. And there was a fear, the, the kind of fear that people talk about in their testimonies when uh, God began to bring them under conviction and they need to be saved. And there was a fear many times of the consequences of what they did. And this teaches us the absolute necessity of that great mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. As no man can come to the Father, but through him. Moses was a mediator between God and man, like Jesus is our mediator. Here in, at Sinai, God gave his people his code of ethics, his guide to live valuable and empowered lives. We need to know this story to see how the law came out of God's desire to offer grace and mercy, uh, to offer freedom and liberty to his people uh, who were physically in bondage to, in, to the Egyptians for over 400 years, but also spiritually in bondage to sin. The children of Israel had done nothing to deserve being rescued from Egypt. God could have started over again with somebody else, but there's a reason why he didn't. He had made a promise to Abraham, and God does not break his promise. The Ten Commandments are an expression of grace and faithfulness on God's part. I might ask, why did God give the Ten Commandments? Anybody answer that? Well, uh, it's gone. Then. He gave them not to hurt, but to help. Not to hamper, but to to release from bondage, not to punish, but to protect. Sometimes we get it all backwards of what God's trying to instruct us to do. Grace doesn't mean we're exempt from the principles of the Ten Commandments. We are saved by grace. We don't keep the Ten Commandments to appease an angry God. We obey to, we obey to show our love for the gracious God that he is, who has forgiven us. Just a little example of the difference in this fear, an awesome fear. Uh, some time ago, 
one of our granddaughters came to visit us here in Sacramento. And uh, we had planned these several days out knowing that she was coming. We were going to have all these activities and things and, and have chance for her to be around some of her uh, other uh, cousins. And this one day we went up in the mountains, we had a boat and we we're in a lake out there. Well, she hadn't gone swimming in a lake before. She'd gone in pools and things like that. She didn't, she wasn't too interested in that. She kind of backed off and, and we tried to encourage her, but she, she just was not interested. Well, she saw a little mud along the edge there, you know, where the waves come in and kind of stir a little mud. She hadn't seen that before. Uh, so, uh, we just kind of let her go. A little bit later, we saw her over by a tree. My wife did rosemary. She went over and she was crying. And she says, why are you crying? And she, she said, because I thought I displeased you. Because she wouldn't do what we said. See, she wanted to, to please us. That's why we need to serve God. We want to please him. And I remembered that since my wife told me how important that was. There is a mistaken view of God. God is seen as angry in the Old Testament, patient in the New Testament. He's, he's seen as revengeful and mean in the Old Testament and loving and kind in the New. God did not go through such uh, attitudinal adjustments between the Old and New Testament. He hasn't mellowed with the passing of time. Malachi 3.6 says, for I am the Lord, I change not. And in Hebrews 13.8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he is God of grace now, he has always been the God of grace. He was a God of grace and mercy back in the Old Testament. A little story that I read, it said, Herman was 93 years old, and he insisted that he could drive a car just as well as he could when he was 39. He was traveling down Interstate 74 when a cell phone rang. It was his wife with an urgent warning. Herman, I just heard in the news that there's a car going the wrong way down Interstate 47. And Herman said, honey, it's not just one car, it's hundreds of them. You see, a lot of people are going the wrong way. They need to know how they can turn around and go the right way. And that's an important illustration to realize we can think we're doing the right thing. Everybody else is doing the wrong thing. Well, this man was going on the freeway the wrong way. And the Ten Commandments are useful in guiding both collective and individual behavior. We live in a fallen world where morality is defined as what feels right or by what the majority deems to be practical. The Ten Commandments remove the vagueness and ambiguity as to what God expects. The law invested with divine authority and sanction is revered because it embodies the will and wisdom of our creator. God makes it plain that morality is not to be derived from the human standards and the verdict of society, but from God himself. Right and wrong are not determined by the voice of the people, but by the voice of God. I remember I've read most of the writings, I believe, of Charles uh, Finney. He was uh, one of our greatest evangelists in the American time in the 1800s. And before he was saved, he was a lawyer studying the laws of America. And what caused him to turn as he went and studied the law, he saw that there are scriptures after each law that he was studying of why the law was written. This is in the early United States. It was based on biblical principles. So he went and bought a Bible and began to read the Bible to see why the laws are written that way. It caused him to have faith in God and he became a Christian. He changed from being a lawyer to an evangelist. The fundamental orders of Connecticut, the state of Connecticut, established in 1638 and 39, was the first written constitution in America to consider the direct predecessor of the US Constitution, declared that the governor of the, his council 
of elected officials have power to administer justice according to the laws here established and for want thereof according to the rule of the word of God. Now this is way back in 1600s. Also, the Ten Commandments that influenced our profanity and blasphemy laws in the United States reaffirmed by subsequent courts, such as in 1921, the Supreme Court of Maine, and in 1944, the Supreme Court of Florida, and others. And I, uh, some of you know that I was in the post office and retired from the post office, but I was in management and I had to learn the regulations and these big old books we had to go through. And if I didn't know the answer, I had to know how to find it in those books. And the US Postal Administrative Support Manual, the ASM, and it was found in 363.6, it talks about profanity. Any content that is generally considered obscene, deceptive, or defamatory, or bad language is forbidden in the post office by the employees. This came basically from the word of God. That's how our country got started. The Ten Commandments gave man a broad principles of God's moral law, setting forth the only standard of righteousness acceptable to him. Now, the word law is commonly used as a means of rule which regulates conduct. It naturally implies the authority and the power on the part of the lawgiver uh, for its enforcement the proper penalty to be inflicted in the case of the violation. Originally, the law was spoken by God in the context calculated to produce fear and unforgettable awe is really what that was referring to, according to Exodus 19. It was afterwards written by the finger of God. Now, this is an amazing thing. Written by the finger of God. This was first person. God said it. He wrote it down. And two table on two tables of stone, according to Exodus 31 and 32. In fact, it was inscribed by God the second time in Exodus 34 and Deuteronomy 10. Later, the two tables of stone were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, Exodus 25-21 and Deuteronomy 10-5 and thus enshrined as the very center of Israel's worship. Today, we no longer live under the old law of Moses. We have a new testament, a new covenant given to us through Jesus. Hebrews 9.15 says, And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The commandments have a peculiar distinction, having been written by the finger of God, which I've already said, uh, on, stables of stone, on tables of stone. Uh, they were therefore direct writings of God. They are themselves the crystallization of the entire law given to Moses. They are summarized by Christ when he said to the Jewish lawyer, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. It's found in Matthew 36 to 40. And we're going to see why that's so important as we get in more into this subject. The Apostle Paul summarized the law in two great statements. First, the laws of fulfilling of the law, and for all the laws fulfilled in one word. There we go back to that, that one word again, uh, the Hebrews way of saying the commandments. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, in Galatians 5.14. It's also stated this in Romans 13.10. So also, James has written, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. The law is fulfilled in the exercise of love, which is the duty of every child of God. This limited declaration of commandments from God is termed the law, which is 
is proven beyond question in Romans 7, 7 through 14. In this passage, the apostle states, I have not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So he learned what law was and how he was disobeying God's law. Further in the Ten Commandments, it is the heart of the law of the Old Testament. The principles of the law are restated under grace. The period of the law is limited to the period of about 1,500 years, from Moses to Christ. These boundaries are fixed beyond question in the word of God. As there were two tables, it would be natural to suppose the five commandments were recorded on each tablet. Though the fact that the tablets were written on both of their sides, most people don't know that, but you can find that in Exodus 32, 15. Uh, this would seem to weaken the force of the argument for the equal division. Moreover, the first five commandments in the Ten Commandments, Exodus and Deuteronomy, is more than four times longer than the second. Many modern scholars assign the commandments to the ta uh, first table uh, and six to uh, four commandments to the first table and six to the second. This has the advantage of assigning all duties of God to the first table and the duties of man to the second. It also goes along with our Lord's meaning of the whole uh, of the commandments of, to two in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. A comparison of the text and the commandments in Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20 reveals a number of differences, especially in the reasons assigned uh, to the observance uh, in the fourth commandment, in the fifth commandment, and also in the, the 10th commandment. The natural, uh, the natural explanation of these differences is the fact that Deuteronomy employs uh, the free and easy style of public training and discourse. The 10 commandments are substantially the same in the two passages. Looking at a, a minister uh, a manual for pastors, uh, there was an editor of a small weekly newspaper in the town in the West, which and he was having a hard time uh, filling the com uh, columns of his paper. And so he went to the typesetter and said, just type the Ten Commandments and put him in there. And uh, it was typed without editorial comment. Three weeks after the paper was published, he received a letter saying, please cancel my subscription. You're getting too personal. And the thing is today, Bibles aren't allowed to be read openly in schools and many of the institutions. It's changed. They don't want to. Read. It's getting too personal. When and where did God give Moses, the children of Israel, the uh, and the children of Israel, the Ten Commandments. You can find it in Exodus 19. Anybody answer that? Well, God gave the commandments on Mount Sinai three months after the people's deliverance from the Egyptians. Prior to this time, the children of Israel had been slaves. They came out of Egypt with no government body or other than one leader appointed by God. No rules or regulations other than those given to them through Moses by the word of God. Apparently they had lived together and for three months in this state. Now God calls Moses up to the mountain to establish his rules and guidelines for their conduct and worship in light. Let's look at Let's look at each of the Ten Commandments here. I'm going to uh, see what I can do here and stick so you can see it. Let's see that. The first commandment. First one is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The first commandment prohibits the worship of any god other than Yehwa. They wouldn't even say that word. They took the vowels out and it was Y-H-W-H because they had such reverence for God's name. An English equivalent of the Hebrew word 
for God also translated Jehovah. This precept teaches the worship of one God. For the people of God were surrounded by idolaters and had been for 400 years. Whatever may have been the notions and practices of the mass of the Israelite people, they always spoke in words that harmonized with a strict monotheism. In other words, one God. Now the second, I'm not sure you can see this real well. I'm having a hard time holding it in the right place and reading it here. But thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images any or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children upon the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The second commandment forbids the use of images in worship, even the image of God himself. Well, they haven't seen God, or even the use of the word in an irreverent way. It's not to be tolerated. This is uh, interesting when I, uh, my wife and I and some others were going to Greece several years ago, uh, we were, they say 90, 97% of the people in, in Greece are Greek Orthodox. And um, they told me why they broke away from the Catholic Church was because of the, uh, the images and, and statues and things they had in the sanctuary. They don't believe in that, and the Catholics did. So it's kind of interesting. Let's go to the third commandment. Exodus 27. Thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. I believe this is a very important one even today. God's name is sacred, as standing for his person. Therefore, it must be used in no vain or false way. The commandment, no doubt, includes more than false swearing, cursing, blasphemy, or every profane use of God's name, which are forbidden. Now, in ancient times, the center of Jewish life still and still does has immense meaning for the word God. In fact, you'll never see in writing, in the Jewish writings, G-O-D, even in the Jerusalem times, in Jerusalem, where they ever mention Lord or God, uh, they take out O. And uh, in fact, it has become a primary symbol of Judaism and is used as an emblem on the Israeli coat of arms. And I turn it right here. Uh, it says, here, O Israel, the Lord, that's capital L dash R D, is our God, G dash D. The Lord, L dash R D, is one. So they find that very important and they're very careful how they write his name, how they speak his name. I was in another country traveling and uh, I was with a minister who constantly was, was saying, oh God, oh my God, oh my God, see this, oh my God. And it really grieved me. I couldn't understand, why is he doing this? And he had won a convert, recently gotten saved and didn't know much about the gospel, but he was in the car with us driving. And I noticed this minister had been mentoring this new convert because he started talking just like him. As he was going down the road, he says, oh my God, look at that tree. And I, I said, are you asking God to look at that tree? If you're not, you're using it in vain. I had to say something because it was grieving me. And it's very important, I've heard uh, many people use the Lord very loosely or God very loosely. 
Also, the derivative of the word derived from uh, the root name or uh, even imitate an offshoot of the word for another person or God. And I'm thinking of three words you'll often hear, gosh, darn, gee, things like this. Uh, stay away from those. Show reverence to God. Okay, the... Someone have something to say? Can you hear me now? We can right. hear you now, sir. I don't know what happened there. Um, the fourth commandment in Exodus 20, 9 through 11, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within the, thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, Sabbath day and hallowed it. I, um, I was reading from a, the Signs of a Time book. And they had an example several years ago uh, in a story in London where uh, they call it costermonger. I guess that's a person who sells goods, especially fruit and vegetables in the, in the market. But he told Lord Shaftbury that their donkeys, which rested one day in seven, could travel 30 miles a day with their loads, while those donkeys that work seven days a week could only travel 15 miles a day. So you lose 75 miles to tra travel each week by working your donkey every day and have a sick, seedy looking donkey in the bargain. While you gain 3,900 miles of travel a year and have a sleek, nice looking donkey by running him uh, according to the Ten Commandments. Uh, you might say, uh, well, what has a donkey to do with the Ten Commandments? Why, do you remember what I just read in Deuteronomy 5:14? It says, Thou shalt not do any work, nor thy ox, nor thy ass, nor thy cattle. He who made both mankind and donkey knew what he was talking about. And it was for our benefit. In Exodus 20:11, emphasize the religious aspect of the Sabbath. While Deuteronomy 5.14, the other uh, rendition of the Ten Commandments, lays stress on the humane aspect. And Deuteronomy 5.15 uh, links it with the deliverance from the bondage of Egypt. While Jesus lived on earth, he repeated all except one of the Ten Commandments given to Moses. That one concerning the Sabbath day. Most Christians choose to keep Sunday as their day of worship. Uh, because that's when Christ rose from the dead. The apostles within a few years, although they were doing both for a while, uh, both Saturday, the Sabbath and Sunday, uh, within a few years pulled away from the synagogues as they began to worship in their homes on Sunday, the first day of the week. I find it very interesting that the scriptures say when Jesus rose from the dead, early on the first day of the week, and I've done some study on this, but it was interesting uh, that which began to change from the Jewish time to the Roman days time uh, throughout the New Testament. Uh, we do not have a time to discuss this, but you remember Eutychus on the first day of the week, which had been on Sunday, uh, he preached, Paul preached late into the evening and he fell asleep and fell out the window. Well, so we understand all the way through the New Testament, it's basically going midnight to midnight instead of evening to evening as the old testament i find that very interesting let's go to the the fifth commandment 
Exodus 20, 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The transition from duties to God to duties of men is made naturally in the fifth commandment, which instructs reverence for parents to whom their children should look up with gratitude as all men should look toward God, their father. Now the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20, 13. Human life is precious and sacred that no man should dare take it away by violence. That's including the unborn. This commandment is referring to murder. Uh, the following chant is pronounced death by man for those that murder. I remember when I was, I believe I was learning the Ten Commandments when I uh, was in about middle school. And I got to thou shall not kill. And, and kind of, I looked at that and I remember walking down the sidewalk and an ant was crossing the sidewalk and I stepped around it because I didn't want to kill the ant. And I was getting the message. But <laughs> We're talking about human beings in the in the precept here. So, uh, but I took it seriously. I think it's all right sometimes to take the God, uh, the Bible, absolutely seriously. Sometimes we uh, maybe too literally, but that's better than not taking it literal enough. So let's go on now to the seventh uh, commandment here. Uh, the seventh commandment says, "Thou shalt." not commit adultery. The family life is safeguarded by the seventh commandment. Fornication was included. Um, in the seventh commandment, the fornication is also included uh, according to Matthew 15, 19. And it, this is interesting. We can't go into this too much, but we find in, in Mary, the mother of Jesus, Joseph could have brought her to open shame. And in Deuteronomy 24, if a man, and this is the bill of divorcement written by Moses, this was according to uh, a man, a woman who was a spouse to a man before they were married, and he accused her of being immoral, being in whoredom or something, but he couldn't prove it. You're going to bring into open shame, then he gave her freedom to marry another. That's the only time in the Bible that was ever allowed. If she was guilty of that crime and found guilty, you go back to Deuteronomy 22. Both the man and spots responsible and the woman would be killed. So we know what he's talking about here. Let's, uh, let's go to the eighth commandment here. Thou shalt not steal. The Eighth Commandment forbids theft in all its forms. It also recognizes the right of personal ownership of property. So this is a, an important aspect that we, uh, another study you can go into. The ninth, as we look at it here in Exodus 20, 16 and 17, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The Ninth Commandment safeguards guards, uh, honor, and good name among mankind. Slander, false testimony uh, in court are sins. Even today, you perjure yourself in sin in, 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 a, in the court of law, you're in big trouble because that's one of the harshest penalties given. And if you tell a lie and blame somebody for something they didn't do, then that's called perjury. So that came from the commandments. Now the 10th commandment says in Exodus 20, 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his ass or anything that is thy neighbor's. The 10th commandment is the most searching of all of them. For it forbids the re, uh, re inward longing uh, and covetous desire to have something of somebody else's. The presence of such deeply spiritual command among the Ten Commandments or Ten Words shows that we have before us 
no mere code of laws defining crimes, but the body of ethical and spiritual precepts for the moral education of the people of God. That says very clear, we need to follow his word. This is the first time, I believe, uh, where the thoughts and desires of the heart are brought out in the commandments. Where if you, uh, uh, you have a thought in your mind that's evil, you're judged here. We talk about in the New Testament, sins of the heart. It's not mentioned so much in the Old Testament, but here in this commandment it is. There was a certain tr Christian school superintendent of the junior department was surprised to find that the offering which had been outside the door of the department room had not been given to the treasurer. A little checking revealed that one member of the department had been slipping out the door and pocketing the offerings. The same boy just a few months before had won an award for learning a great number of Bible verses, including the Ten Commandments. When confronted with its wrongdoing, he saw no relationship between taking the offerings and the commandments he had memorized. See, he had really not learned them at all. He could quote them, but he hadn't learned them. There are many people who can quote things about the Bible, but they don't know them. Breaking any of these commandments is a sin, and God's punishment under the law was sure. Today, man knows God's requirements and fails to do them. It is also sin. James 4.17 says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And punishment, though not always immediate, is sure to come. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And in Hebrews 2, verses 1 and 2, Therefore we ought to give a more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, it goes on to saying, how shall we escape? So Exodus 19.5 states God's promises to the children of Israel if they keep his commandments. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, and ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, it states a similar thing. He promised that they would be a peculiar treasure and that he would bless and prosper them. God never changes. Today, to those who serve him faithfully, he has given many promises and blessings here and eternal life in the world to come. Mark 10, 30 says, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. And I find this peculiar here with persecution and in the world to come eternal life. That one there, you could take that and give a full study just on those two words there with persecution. Doesn't mean we're gonna have it easy, but God's gonna be with us. We won't be alone. He didn't give any of the Ten Commandments or quoted from Deuteronomy 6, 5. Thou shalt not love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And in Leviticus, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So these, are, these two great commandments are also in the Old Testament. In Matthew 22, 4, Jesus said, On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. These two commandments cover all the precepts God has given. If one truly loves God and his neighbor, he will do what God requires him. Only way a person can love God with all his heart is first have his sins forgiven, repent of his sins, and turn to God, and God will change his heart. How many times we've heard testimonies of people coming in they knew nothing about the gospel, but when they came down, they got saved, God did something. He transformed their life. They lived a new life. After they left, maybe after work, they always went across and had a beer with the gang. But after they got saved, they didn't want to do that anymore. They may not have seen it in the Bible where it taught for or against it, but they 
didn't feel that way. God had put something in their heart. Do you remember the reply of the young, rich, young ruler when Jesus told him he would have eternal life if he would keep the commandments? How did Jesus answer in that case? You find this in Matthew 19, 16 through 22. The six commandments Jesus mentioned of the young man were the six that covered the person's relationship with his fellow man. The young man said he had kept all those from his youth up and then asked what still he lacked. Jesus answered and showed that he lacked one thing, his relationship with God. The first four commandments he was neglecting. His riches had come between him and, and God. He had made idols of them and broken the first two commandments. Anything in our lives that puts God in a secondary place can become the same as an idol and hinder our love for the Lord. Today, we live under the New Testament covenant through Jesus Christ and not under the old law of Moses. Under the new covenant where does God tell us he put his laws? Anybody answer that real quick? Kind of been leading up to it. All right. I heard my wife in the other room says in our hearts. But go ahead, Randy. In our hearts and in our minds. Amen. That's what it says. Yeah, and that's in the Old Testament. Yeah. In, in Jeremiah yeah. 31 and through 33, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts or hearts and write them upon their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now let's go to the New Testament and Hebrews 10, 16 and 17. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds. That's what Brother Randy said. And their, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He said, to write them on the, uh, the laws upon their hearts. Similar as when the table's a stone, he wrote it with his own hand. With his own hand, he's going to put the laws on our hearts. When his law is fixed in our hearts and minds, we have peace with God and live in harmony with him. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to read Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The scripture teaches us man must believe God and hold him in the highest esteem and honor. Only if man believes that God's word says, will he worship and serve him? We see that today. They can, a politician quotes scripture, but if, do they really believe it? If they did, they'd be living by it. Others in the world are neighbors all around us. Therefore, the fear of God wants his children to have, uh, the fear that God wants, uh, wants his children to have a fear of reverence and awe. You ever have something you see? I remember climbing up in the mountains and going around the corner, and, and all of a sudden I saw a view of a mountain with a snow cap, completely hidden, from, and it just was awe. Almost takes your breath away. Well, a little bit similar to that in looking at God with reverence and awe. Uh, fear that will stir man to love God with the deepest of emotions, with a true honor and esteem. And I, you know, I, I don't know if you felt as you, we went through this today, like I didn't know I was studying it, but the Ten Commandments, I got more out of it these last few weeks than I have ever in my life. It's amazing the things that are there. 
and they're inexhaustible. You can go through them and find little things in there that you could build upon in an entire Bible study. But uh, that comes to the end of what I have. So, Brother O. Thank, hello. Thank you so very much, um, Pastor Mark. God bless you. Um, we have certainly enjoyed the lesson this morning. We are so blessed um, to be taught God's first written laws. We are grateful to God for this beautiful Sunday school lesson. And we do want to let everyone know that the lesson will be up on our websites by the end of the day um, on our YouTube page. So please kindly um, visit the YouTube page and you should have uh, the lesson up there by the end of today. By the grace of God at 11 o'clock today, um, we will be joining in many, we should be joining in with Portland Headquarters Church for the morning worship service. Tehacha P2 has the morning worship service at 11. And I'm sure um, um, Sacramento Church as well. Um, also, Pullman will be having a morning worship service at 11.30. I want to let everyone know that uh, the church, I was just at the church. The church is all clean and ready, uh, no highs. We had our first major snowstorm, which was quite early uh, yesterday morning, but the church is all ready to go for everyone this morning. Um, I was just there a few minutes ago uh, while listening and enjoying this lesson. So uh, don't stay home because of the highs. It's all clear in the church. Uh, be ready to come and God will bless you. Uh, also, Seattle will be having the morning worship service at 11 as their devotional at 5. Langley will be having um, another uh, time of service at 4 p.m. today over Zoom. Uh, let's join in with all these meetings and, of course, Portland Evening Evangelistic and Revival Service at 6 p.m. today. Thank you once again for being here this morning for being part of the of the Sunday school. God bless you all. Um, let's have a time of prayer now. Um, I, I no, noticed that uh, our Tehachapi Church, there's a number of people there listening into this lesson. Would someone um, in Tehachapi Church, if your heart is just uh, beating uh, now, maybe the Spirit of God is touching your heart like you could pray for us okay how about that let's have that this morning someone from Tehachapi Church um the uh, right there now can unmute and close us out in prayer God bless you all for coming we'll see you all next Sunday by the grace of God our pastor Scott Wells our pastor in Langley Canada has been appointed by Portland to teach the lesson next Sunday God bless you. THRP, can someone please kindly pray there for us this morning? Can you hear me okay, brother? Yes, we can, sir. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the law that you've written in the Bible. And thank you for the law that you've written in our hearts, Lord. We want it to do the work it's meant to do. Jesus, be the word of God in us. We pray for victory this week, Lord. Give us victory over sin. Help us to be witnesses of your goodness and grace. Help yes. us to testify, Lord. You've changed our hearts. You've changed yes. our lives. Yes. Live in us, Lord. We Amen. ask this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much again. And thanks to Pastor Mark uh, Washington, too, for this beautiful, beautiful lesson. God bless you all. Have a pleasant Sunday. Make sure to support your local church. And God bless you as you do that. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, God bless. Bye, everyone. Bye. God bless. God bless. God bless. God bless. Bye, Mark. God bless. Bye, Brother Mark. Brother Mark. Before. Bye, Rhonda.